Patty. And welcome everyone. We're glad to have you out. And happy Father's Day to our men here. Uh, announcements. Uh, there will be an over 60 dinner tomorrow at the Legion Hall. I hope that's right, but that's what everyone kept telling me yesterday. And today is graduation for the seniors in Smith Center. So that will be great for those kids. Okay, do we have any birthdays? joy we had rain and I hope we get a little more without any bad storms any other joys okay then we will do our centering words God can turn even our worst moment into possibilities for good God can transform even our worst experiences into opportunities for grace and now will you take your hymnals and turn to 98, to God be the glory. We'll sing verses 1 and 3.
call to worship? Come to God who gathers us in. We come to God who nurtures us like a father. We come to God whose arms are open and waiting. We come to God who welcomes and forgives us. We come to God who journeys with us. We come to God who sees us as we really are and loves us anyway. Come praising our loving, nurturing God. And now we will say the prayer in unison. God, our parent, we gather to open our hearts to you, trusting that you will welcome us with open arms. We come to worship you, the one who leads us through times of trial, the one who supports us in sorrow and struggle, the one who is beside us when all is bleak. Holy One, we, we praise you. you. Amen. All right. I will offer once again, is there anyone who has anything special they want to say or, or uh, tell us at this particular time? <coughs> not, then we will move on to our scripture for today. Our scripture for today comes from Genesis, and it's the story of Joseph and Jacob. So J Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. His jealous brother sold, the jealous brothers, uh, all 11 of them, sold him into slavery. So listen now to our scripture reading. It's Genesis 37, verses 1 through 4. Jacob settled into the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age. And he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I want to wish all of you fought men, uh, what few there are here, happy Father's Day today. Um, Today is Father's Day, and because of that, I chose this particular passage from the 37th chapter of Genesis. It's a story that's familiar to most people. It's the day that Joseph receives his colorful coat from his father, Jacob. And it must have been a great day for Joseph to receive that coat, but it was not equally great for his 11 brothers. Now, good fathers love their children uniquely. I will say that again. Good fathers love their children uniquely. Now that may sound odd to you, but each, each child is a unique individual. And Jacob, Jacob loved his sons, but he didn't love all of them in, in the way that, that he should have. He didn't love all of the qualities that there were about all of his sons. Now verse 3 says that Jacob loved Joseph more than his other sons, because he was born in his old age. It probably didn't hurt either that he was born of Jacob's favorite wife as well, of the four that he had. And so how many of you had fathers who had favorites? Anybody have fathers who had favorites? No. Uh, I, fathers in families, favoritism, if it exists in the family, all the children know it exists whether we want to admit it or not. Neil Kennedy once said that there's no greater influence in the lives of, of children than the words that we as parents speak over them. The blessing of a father and parents is incredibly potent and powerful, and our words give children potential. As a father, you can prophesy their future. Now, how many of you remember Ward Cleaver? Remember the, the Leave it to Beaver? A television series well you have to be older than I am to remember that because I can only remember it in reruns it ran from 1957 to 1963 and I was not old enough back then to have been able to remember so I only remember it from the reruns 
Uh, and so Ward, if you thought, looked at Ward as, as you watched that, that incredible program, you saw Ward and he was an exceptional father, he was an exceptional husband, he was an exceptional community leader. And, and he seemed to have a, the answer to all of the problems that ever occurred on that lovely show. There was no way to say it, but Ward was a good man. He was a lucky man because he was married to June and because uh, he was married to this sweetheart that he'd had forever. And she did all the housework in her lovely dress and her high heels. And, and she was always baking cookies uh, and doing the housework in, in that dress and high heels. And, and I can't even imagine doing all of that in the dress and high heels. Now, you know, she, she was always there for their sons, Walter and Theodore, or, or um, you know, doing everything, the Wally or Beaver, what they were called by others. And, and so they, they painted the picture of this perfect family. And so here we had Ward and June and Wally and Beaver or uh, Theodore and, and uh, Walter, which however you wanted to call them. And uh, if you were, if I remember correctly, you know that, that the family itself was so so perfect, and yet there were some other characters in the show that were a little less than perfect. How many of you remember Eddie Haskell? He wasn't a really great guy, was he? Uh, he was kind of a jerk at times. And, and then Beaver had these friends, Larry Mandello and Whitey, and sometimes they could be real troublemakers. I, I, I can remember the episode where Beaver fell in love with his, his teacher, Miss Landers, and that was quite the episode. Uh, and, but it, it never failed. Whatever the problem was on that, uh, on that TV show, no matter what problem there was, Ward always had an answer for that problem. He could always solve the boy's problem or the problem uh, of the episode in that 30 minute time frame and it was always perfect. Now, how many of you have problems that get solved in 30 minutes in your, in your lives? Most of us don't. No one ever questioned Ward's love for his family. No one ever questioned his future employment. No one ever came up with the skeletons from his closet. He had, it didn't have any bad habits or addictions. There, were, there was no reason for you to question the, the perfect perfectness of Ward Cleaver. He was the perfect father and foundation for that family. He was the perfect husband. But can I be honest with you? My home doesn't look like that. The home I grew up in didn't look like that. And maybe yours doesn't either. Maybe yours has some imperfections too. But society has certain things that it tells us we should be happening if we are to be good parents. Well, I wanna, I wanna give you the 12 characteristics that society says make a good father. Now listen to these. Number one, they're a good disciplinarian. Number two, they allow their children to make their own mistake. Three, they're open-minded. Four, they teach their children to appreciate things. Five, they accept the fact that their children aren't exactly like them. Six, they spend quality time with their children. Seven, they lead by example. Eight, they're supportive and loyal. Nine, they challenge their children. 10, they teach them uh, lessons. 11, they protect their families. And 12, they show unconditional love. Now, how many of us could meet all 12 of those even as parents? Most of us at one point or another have probably failed at one or more of those. Sociologists tell us that Ward and June Cleaver and other television parents uh, of the 60s cast a curse on society because they were just too perfect. Anyone, no one could live up to the standards of being Ward or June Cleaver. Uh, have you ever felt guilty about something you did as a parent? How many of you have ever felt guilty? I know I have. You know, we, we do things and we feel guilty. How many of you have ever, you know, uh, fallen short 
you know, of being able to give your child exactly what they want or, or you know, not had, had to give them a, a less than perfect meal because you were in a hurry and had other things to do instead of spending hours in the kitchen creating that masterpiece meal. You know, there are times when we fall short as parents, and, and that's the truth with all of us as human beings. There's one great difference between Ward and June Cleaver and the rest of us, and that is Ward and June Cleaver lived in the entertainment world. They were a part, they were a creation of the entertainment industry, and we live in the real world. And in the real world, there are times when we're going to feel guilty because we aren't doing things the, the perfect way, when we can't answer a problem in, in 30 minutes. And when it comes to our parenting skills, we're going to have times when we feel like we're just not quite enough. And we're not alone in that. All of us at some time experience that kind of feeling. And one of the reasons that the Bible resonates with us and the stories of the people here is because, for one, they were created in Hollywood. And second, it's because we see how real these people are. Now, when we read the story of, of Jacob and Joseph, we can truly imagine how complicated that life must have been. Here Jacob was. He had worked for all this time for one particular bride and instead ends up with her sister and her, his, the bride he wants, plus then two maidservants, who all have children. He has 12 children in total. And, and uh, the two that he was, gets from the wife that has been his favorite only come in his own old age. Imagine how complicated things must have been for Jacob having to deal with four women and 12 children. We all have enough trouble figuring out how to deal with one husband or wife and a few children, let alone 12 and four spouses. So it was a complicated situation. And we wouldn't have expected that Jacob was going to be perfect. Just like with the original father in Adam. Here Adam was and he had the, the perfect opportunity to be the perfect man and Eve had the perfect ability to be the perfect wife and yet they sinned against God and got thrown out of the garden and then they had to deal with with Cain who kills his brother Abel and that wasn't solved in 30 minutes that didn't come a, come to a completion in in a 30 minute life segment and then there's Noah when we look at the story of Noah here was this man who was chosen to, to carry on for the rest of humanity and he's taken on to the, the ship that he builds for God. And, but yet, after the ship lands, and he and his children find that space, where do we find Noah but laying face down, drunk, cursing his children, and, and sending his descendants into slavery? Abraham, the father of the nation, the problem uh, that, that he had in, in that he didn't have Isaac until his old age. You know, here he was, uh, he, he was promised to be this father of this great nation, and yet here Isaac didn't come till a late age, but he tried to handle that problem on his own. And where did it get him? With another servant and another child from that servant. But in the end, he ended up having to send away and off into the wilderness. None of us are perfect at this thing we call life. Jacob wasn't the perfect father. And when we look through the Bible, we see people who are struggling with problems and struggling with this thing we call life in all of its richness. To say the least, here, the, this life that Jacob was leading was a complex one. And, and it would be Joseph, the son who, who his brothers hated, that would save the family after he had spent some time in Egypt and learned how to have a little humility. All of us have some things that we need to learn on occasion, and all of us have times when we're not necessarily the perfect person that we would want to be. But 
in order uh, to, to continue to be the people we need to be, we need to turn to our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father is the one true Father who can, we can lean on and who is perfect and will love us unconditionally regardless of, of, of the imperfections we see in ourselves. Now Jacob failed to love his children uniquely uh, and Jacob should have been more like Ward Cleaver. We all want to be more like Ward or June Cleaver and to, to be able to, to see life be so easy. But to be, uh, to be, to look like that, we, we need to, we, we, we're just not going to because we have imperfections as humans. If we truly look at ourselves, we all have to admit that we are imperfect human beings. John Eldridge, who's the author of Wild at Heart and Fathered by God, among many other books that he's written, he talks about a particular instance of uh, fishing with his dad. Now, how many of you ever went fishing with your dad? That was one of the things I loved to do with my dad, was to go fishing with my dad. But we have to admit, not all dads are the dads that they need to be. And Eldridge tells us that, that spending hours together with his dad on Saturday mornings fishing, that was something he prized. But unfortunately, he writes that the fish were never the issue. What was the issue was that that what he longed for was the presence of his father there with him, that he would delight in his son, and that didn't, wasn't happening. In fact, uh, Eldridge's father became an alcoholic and, and succumbed to that alcoholism and was mostly gone from Eldridge's life uh, for the majority of his life. He tells, he tells in his books about how that, that void was left in his life that void of the work that his father should have been doing in his life. He needed more, and he needed to be shown the way. His father's work was unfinished, but then he recalls a time in his mid-twenties where he was at, went out uh, to go fishing. He decided, because his father's work was unfinished, that something that, that he had tre treasured was that fishing. So, Symbolic of his time with his dad, he went out to try and replicate that fishing part of it, and he took up fly fishing. He went out to go fly fishing, and he went to the river, and he started to, to throw out his line and attempt to catch the rainbow trout that he could see everywhere there in the river, but could not catch a single one. And there was a guy down the river who was casting out a line, and it seemed like every time he cast out, he was catching those trout and was whooping and laughing and having a good time at fishing out on that river. Now finally, Eldridge decided he was going to stop and just go back onto the, onto the bank of the river and watch that gentleman that was standing down the river. And so he did. He walked out of the river and he stood there on the bank. He was watching this gentleman that was down the river trying to learn what it was he was doing so that he could, could, you know, have that same kind of experience. Well, finally, the gentleman noticed Eldridge standing there on the bank of the river, and he told him to come on down. Well, it turned out that the gentleman that was down there was a guide, a fly fishing guide, and so he, that's what he did as a profession. And so he, he put on the right kind of fly on Eldridge's line, he set, it up, set up his pole the way it needed to be, he gave him some instruction on what he needed to do, and he sent him out into the river like a father uh, is teaching their boy to, to throw a baseball or to shoot a basket. And he stood there and helped him, instructing him and encouraging him through that process. And pretty soon, Eldridge was able to start catching those trout and do exactly what he had seen this man doing. He had hooked a trout and landed it, and pretty soon the gentleman went back into the river and went in there to show him exactly how to release the trout and exactly what to do from there. And he, he reports in his book how much fun he had in that time. But what he also tells us in the book is this. As I drove home, I knew the gift that had been given to me from God. He said that he, this, through this man, through this man who had been there, God had come along and fathered me through this man. Uh, and, and I love that story. To think about that it doesn't have to be our fathers. It doesn't have to be mothers in particular. 
the, the one that we were given, but it can be any person who chooses to come into our lives and minister to us in God's name. God has a way of bringing us those things that we need. God steps in where we as imperfect, imperfect people have left our jobs unfinished. And that's not to say that earthly fathers always fail, or mothers for that matter either, but rather that we are human and that there is only one perfect father, and he is our father in heaven. Dad, and for, for those of us who are parents, there are two things we need to constantly be telling our children, and that is on a regular basis, and that is, I love you, and I'm proud of you. And I say that because those are the, that's the encouragement that our Heavenly Father gave His Son when He came to earth. This is my Son, whom I love, and with whom I am well pleased. He was always there to show His pleasure with Jesus as His Son. And we too need to understand that God is there telling us how well pleased He is with us. After years of combing through every verse in the Bible, dozens of times, in all of that time, I have never, ever found the perfect parent in that Bible, the perfect human being. But we do have a perfectly perfect Heavenly Father. What we can find in God's words are some godly fathers who have either godly or ungodly children, but there are no perfect fathers or mothers. One imperfect parenting challenged father by the name of Samuel said this when talking about his children. He said, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but teach you the good and the right way. In 1 Samuel 12, 23. The delightful re reality is that God only asks us to pray and, and to follow his word. Not to produce perfect families, but to pray and to follow him. To, to listen for his wisdom. To sit on his lap and to feel his warmth and his love and his compassion for us. God wants us to know that we are his. And that he loves each and every one of us in our uniqueness. God knows us. He knows all our weaknesses. He knows our faults. But rather than trying to be perfect, what God wants us to do is to listen to him, to follow his word, and to sit at his feet, and to be there to know that we are loved, that we, that we are loved unconditionally. Then to follow him like children, and to teach our children to do the same. Amen. So the questions for today are this. Have there been any challenges in understanding and experiencing God as the father heart in your life? Or mother heart, if that works better for you. But have, have you had any challenges in understanding and experiencing God as that godly parent to you? And what has the Lord taught you about your relationship with him as our, your father in heaven? So, something to think about. All right. Our prayer song for today is, leave it there. We are going to sing verse 2. So if you would turn in your hymnals and join me in verse 2 of leave it there, we'll prepare ourselves for prayer. If your body suffers pain and your health you can't regain and your soul is almost sinking in despair Jesus knows the pain you feel He can save and He can heal Take 
Father God and sustainer, creator, we praise you for your care and your protection, for the wisdom and leading and guidance and compassion and mercy that you show for each and every one of your children as you surround us like a father. On this Father's Day, we remember all the people who have nurtured us, especially those who were important in our lives, those who have, we, who have seen not just with their eyes, but with their hearts. And today we remember fathers. We remember the fathers whose families have been torn apart by jealousy or fighting or misunderstandings. We remember fathers who are older, but who still bear the responsibility of raising children and grandchildren. We remember fathers who mean well but make mistakes. And we remember fathers who are unable to support their children and who are forced to make unimaginable decisions. We remember fathers who have adopted children and fathers who have given up their rights as fathers. We remember fathers who have rejoiced in the achievements of their children and who joyfully have watched a new generation take this world into their hands. We remember the fathers who are single parents, who through personal sacrifice and perseverance provide a loving home for their children. And we remember fathers who helplessly watch their children suffer and die. We pray for fathers where there have been recent disasters that have occurred around them. And we remember fathers who are dealing with children who are sick or disabled and who will try anything to do what they need to to find a cure or to heal their children. We pray for those fathers who live in fear, who live in places in the world that are caught in ter the terrors of violence, and we weep for those fathers who deal every day with the, that infliction of violence upon themselves and upon their children. Nurturing God, hear our prayers for all fathers around the world as we thank you for those who have been nurtured us, who have opened our eyes to the plight of so many families around the world for whom life is difficult. Help us, O oh Father God, to share your love and mercy with all the fathers and families around the world. As our world continues to wrestle with COVID-19 and the brokenness of discrimination and injustice in this world, which has be have, become a to have become a commonplace thing in our world, we ask, Lord, that you would fill us with your loving spirit so that we might speak to one another in loving ways, so that we may be respectful of the needs of all of the people around us. Remove from us our inward focus so that we can see the ways uh, that we impact others around us. Remove from us all the things that would keep us from seeing those who are in need. And surround us with people who, will fill, who are filled with your loving spirit so that they might speak words of loving wisdom to us as we navigate this ever-changing world. Lord, we are your people, we are your children, and we are desperately in need of your healing touch, your healing from pain, from frustration, from grief from anger, from all the things that overwhelm our world. And we come to you praying that you would be with each and every person here on this earth. We pray for all those in our community as we pray especially for the Paul Allen family, Lord. We ask that you would be with them as they continue to work through their grief and the loss of a loved one in their lives. Lord, we ask that you would be with Esther and with Joe, and that you would continue to strengthen her, and that you would continue to support and encourage him in all the things that need to be done prior to this knee replacement. We ask that you would bring forth loving individuals who have come in to encourage. 
We pray for Norris, that he will continue to, to get better and better as each day goes by. And we pray for Les as he prepares for cataract surgery. Lord, we thank you for the rain that you've brought that will feed the crops, the land, the trees, and all of your creation. And we thank you for the many ways that you bless each and every one of our lives. Loving God, we know that it is only in you that we can find comfort and healing. And so we lift our voices. And we ask you to hear our prayers whether they be spoken or unspoken. And so now as we lift our voices and as we come to you, Lord, we ask that you hear these prayers and then now that you would hear also our unspoken prayers as we offer them to you in silence. And so it is, gracious God, that we come to you and we pray in this liminal time that we might be eternally full of your presence, that we may be open to your leading us into a new way of living and being through your Holy Spirit, O God of love. Gracious Father, we ask you to gather now all our prayers together, the spoken, the unspoken, for we know that all things are in your hands as we entrust ourselves and our prayers to you. As we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray as one family, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is 141 in the hymnal, Children of the Heavenly Father, verses 1 and 4. that God's strength is empowering you to be the best you you can be. 
So go now in God's grace and share God's love with all those you meet. Go in God's grace. Amen. Next week, we're going to talk about unsliving in uncertain times. And we're going to start with Job. So we'll be talking about Job and Abraham and a few of the other characters in the Bible who lived through some pretty uncertain times, just as we're li living in some pretty uncertain times at this point. So 